I became a futurist almost by accident. When I was on the aid, the new inventors on ABC, they needed something to call me because my biography is sort of all over the map. It's in technology, it's in teaching, it's in writing. And they decided to call me a futurist. And it turns out that when the national broadcaster calls you a futurist, it sort of sticks. And a lot of people think futurists are a bit like psychics, that we just guess. And it's not really true. And I can't tell you what a lot of numbers are going to be. What I do is I help organizations make decisions about their role in the world in front of them. And I help them when I can to avoid any of the obvious sinkholes in that world. Now, as a futurist, I have the comfort of being able to take a very long horizon. And I have a podcast called The Next Billion Seconds, which is a podcast about the future. A billion seconds is 31 years, seven months, and a few days. It's about a generation. It's a comfortable length of time for a futurist to talk about. Now, futurists don't really always plan in 30-year increments. Sometimes clients will ask for that. More often, clients will ask for it. 5, 10, 15 years. And we enjoy that because it's more easy to be accurate with the shorter time horizon. There's less chance in a five-year time horizon for unexpected events to throw things into doubt. You know, like an unexpected event like a war or a natural disaster or a pandemic. When the unexpected is big enough, it upsets everyone's plans. Pandemics are as big as events get. Pandemics historically have had much larger and longer lasting consequences, both economic and cultural consequences, than any other historical phenomenon, including all of the wars in history. And we're starting to get some sense of just how big it is. But to start with, what I want to do is I want to take a look at what just happened, because there's a lot to learn from what we've just been through, and we're going to need what we've learned to help us on the road ahead. Now, 21st of January, there was an article in the BBC on the website. Here it is. New China virus. And I wrote a friend. I said, hmm, human-to-human -human transmission, spring festival is coming up. This has everything. I was actually deeply worried about this. And it took less than 60 days for the entire rest of the world to shut down, including here in Australia. Why did that happen? Well, it has to do with exponentials. Now, here's the thing about exponentials. With one very notable exception, compound interest. Exponentials aren't really part of any process that we're familiar with in the business world. I mean, the idea is simple enough. You take a number and you multiply it by itself, and you take that number and multiply it by itself, and then you take that number and you multiply it by itself over and over and over. And eventually that number, no matter what number you start with, that number is going to do one of two things. If that number is greater than one, it's going to hit infinity. If that number is less than one, it's going to hit zero. And it doesn't matter how much you're over one or how much you're under one. It can be by the tiniest amount. But if you do it enough times, tiny's not tiny anymore. And that's the logic of how infectious diseases spread. All infectious diseases have this quality that we identify with them. It's the replication number. It's also known as R0, R with a zero. And R0 tells you how many people an infected person is likely to infect. And back in January, before anyone really knew anything about SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus, and before anyone had named it COVID-19, that's the illness, no one really understood how infectious the disease was. Turns out, very infectious. SARS-CoV-2, the average person will infect two to three other people. It has a replication rate of two to three. And that means every two to three multiplies by two to three, multiplies by two to three, and very soon you get very big numbers. And as those numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger, things get increasingly unpredictable. And that sums up the first half of this year pretty well. China got hit with this huge wave of unpredictability. 
It shut itself down in order to arrest the spread of the virus. That's when they learned that people locked down together infect one another. And that's when the Chinese began to pull infected people out and isolating them. And that's when their replication number dropped below one. And it took 11 weeks. But after 11 weeks, Wuhan was able to reopen. And because China is at the epicenter of global commerce, the virus very quickly spread to Europe, spread to America, it spread to Australia, where it spread invisibly and exponentially. And it didn't look like the numbers of infected people were growing very quickly. Each case maybe eventually would result in two or three more, but that also meant that there would be two or three more from that and on and on and on. And suddenly, something that seemed very far away, both in distance and in time, suddenly became very close and very immediate and very, very dangerous. And as the awareness of that danger spread, first among public health officers and scientists and then governments and then institutions and then the broader public, people began to react institutions began to react, governments began to react, and all of that basically all happened at once. Now, how did that look? Well, last week I was lucky enough to, to participate in a Zoom panel with some folks who had some very deep on the ground experience here in Australia about what happened. And Kate Bailey, who's uh, in the middle on the right, she is the head of comms at Coles. And she told us the story of what happened at Coles in late February and early March. She said every morning they'd wake up with a communications plan. By the end of the day, that plan had changed. And I don't mean that that plan had changed a little bit. That plan had changed completely, not once, but several times during the course of the day, so that the end of the day looked nothing like the beginning of the day. And I heard the same thing from the head of comms at Telstra and the head of news at Nova FM and the head of comms for New South Wales Public Health. And around the peak of this, which in Australia was around the 12th of March, in America around the 11th of March, things were changing so quickly. There was so much breaking news happening every moment that any sort of planning by anyone for anything had effectively become impossible. And this is something that I am intensely aware of as a futurist, because a futurist lives with this idea of something called a forward planning horizon. How far out can I reasonably expect the future to bear some resemblance to the present moment? You know, futurists are normally can trust that five or ten years into the future, things will be reasonably like the times. There will be different trends, but you can see those trends amplified. During that fortnight centered around the 12th of March, the forward planning horizon collapsed. And not from years to months or to weeks or even to days, but for a period of time, it was measured in hours. For a period of time, it wasn't possible to know whether the hour that was coming up would be reasonably like the hour that had preceded it. And we all know this because we all experienced it. And I'm naming it because I want to look at the cause of that. And the root cause of that is the reproduction rate, R naught. Now, my friend Sally Deminx put it really well. Because she said to me, Mark, when exponentials get going, when you've multiplied and multiplied and those numbers start to get really big, the horizon that you have in front of you, it suddenly starts to tip upward. And all of a sudden, you see yourself hurtling into a brick wall at full speed. And that's exactly what happened to planet Earth. We hit the wall. We hit the exponential. Bam. And the difference between that and the horizon is the horizon is the space where you get to think that every day is going to be reasonably like the day that came before it. 
but the difference between that wall and that horizon is the R factor. We hit the wall, we crashed into the wall, we wrecked the economy, we went into lockdown, because when you are in an exponential situation like that, the only thing that you can do is get yourself out of it. You have to do whatever it takes to get yourself out of it. You have to exit the burning building before it comes down on you. And so we went and we hid under the duna, which was weird and hard, but also we did come to like it eventually. And it worked. We stopped infecting one another. And the R factor here in Australia started to fall below exponential values. Eventually, it dipped below one. We flattened the curve. And as we flattened the curve, we got more of our horizon back. We could see further into the future. By mid-April, we could kind of make plans for the next week with some assurance that it could probably happen. By the time we got to the beginning of May, we could make plans for the entire month. And because we've managed our R factor so well here in Australia, by the end of the May, we were able to take a look forward basically all the way through to the rest of the year. We have something that's almost unique among the nations of the world right now. We have an ability to forward plan because we have our replication rate under control. We have a forward planning horizon, which is something they don't yet have in the EU or in the United States. And one reason that the United States is so badly melted down right now is because of this, because it's literally making people crazy. They don't know what future they have. They can't see it. They can't plan for it. Now, on the weekend, George Megalogenis wrote in the Fairfax Papers where he pointed to the fact that Australians had worked very hard in this crisis, flattened the curve, and hadn't gotten any tangible benefit out of this. But we know that's not true. We saved thousands of lives. We saved our medical system from being consumed in saving those thousands of lives. We're also now among the first to emerge into the chronic pandemic period, where the R factor is less than one, and we're going to be in this chronic period for a while to come. We're going to do our best to keep the R factor under one. We're not always going to succeed at that. And let me be clear, until there's a vaccine, and no one knows when that will be, but until there is a vaccine, and until that vaccine has been distributed to everyone in Australia and really the world beyond, but let's just start with Australia. We are under the rule of the R factor. There is nothing that we can do to change that. And that means that we're going to have to learn to live with it. So let's take a look at what that world, the world of the chronic pandemic, the world we're in right now, let's take a look at what that world looks like. Now, over the last sort of six, seven, eight weeks, I have done something that I never would have done before the pandemic. I am now providing guidance to clients on a forward planning horizon that is not measured in tens of years, but it's measured in weeks. As a futurist, I've got to be the first person to own the fact that the future is not what it used to be. We are going to work with the forward planning horizon we've got. We've got 30 weeks to the end of the year. We can sort of see our way to that. And the greatest value that I can offer you tonight in conversation is to take you through the major trends that I can spot over this horizon. I'm hoping that you can spot them yourself so that you can lean into them or where it's necessary, where you can avoid them. Because these trends are going to affect every business and every institution here in Australia, in the world as well, but in Australia. The best way to talk about these two trends is to actually take a look at how they're playing out in practice. And to do that, you need look no further than the NRL. Now, the NRL actually raised the idea of resuming play in the middle of March, and it 
to most ears, it sounded like a really poorly timed joke. Yet here we are, and we're about to commence week two of play during the chronic pandemic. That'll happen tonight. Something that appeared to be impossible even in April is actually happening now in June. And how they did that actually defines a template for the businesses can apply in broad terms to their own situations in the post-pandemic environment. It points to four different trends that will dominate business activity through to the end of the year. And the first of these is called the rise of the sterile economy. Because the first thing that the NRL did, and they made it clear because they communicated it clearly in the media. I mean, here's an article about it from uh, a local paper. First thing they did was that they hired a biosecurity officer, actually a whole biosecurity team, but a biosecurity officer. Now, if you work in agribusiness, you're going to be familiar with that role. But almost everyone else in every other line of business actually doesn't even probably even know what a biosecurity officer does. But the biosecurity officer worked with the NRL to design what was effectively a sterile field around the players and the coaches and the venues that would encompass the game for the entire duration of the season. As a contact sport, rugby tells you that even a single infected player or coach can then infect basically the entire league. So the only way the NRL can play safely is by putting the entire league within a sterile field. Now, that plan was developed. The first version of the plan was not perfect. They sent it out to all of their stakeholders. They got a lot of feedback. They took their feedback on board. They changed the plan. And they kept iterating until they got buy-in from all of the stakeholders, until they got buy-in from the teams, from the coaches, even from the referees, from the governments, very importantly, from the venues, from the broadcasters, eventually. And so... Although this season isn't going to be as profitable as the previous seasons or as this season would have been without a pandemic, it will happen. It will keep the league afloat. It will keep the players paid. It will keep the game going. It will keep the broadcasters well fed with content. It is imperfect. But in this world, imperfect is still a great big shining win. Every business in Australia is now having a deep think about how they can reopen and how they can reopen safely. And so every business is now going to be walking a really fine line between being sterile and being profitable. And there's going to be a lot of tension on that point. Two recent stories from other businesses illustrate this really clearly. So I got to duck my head down here so you can see it. That's just from the Fairfax newspapers today. Apparently, although the AFL has created a biosecure field around themselves and their players, ASADA, who drug tests the players, are not subject to those rules. And so there's this glaring hole in their biosecurity field, and it's a risk that they have to swallow because the AFL has to have ASADA drug testers available. So this is kind of the game that they're playing so that they can keep playing the game. Now, over here, this is New Zealand. New Zealand, of course, does a lot of film production out of Wellington. And they have been very clear that they really aren't letting anyone into the country. It's very rare to get a visa to enter New Zealand right now. But they've let in the entire cast and crew of the Avatar sequel that's being filmed in Wellington at Weta Studios. And it was effectively because they were threatened with losing an enormous amount of creative work, which is vital to the economy of New Zealand, if they didn't do this. Well, here we are. And here they are, and they've let a bunch of people in from America, and they're hoping, they are quarantined, they're hoping that that means that they're still in their biosecurity area. But you can see this continuing tension between trying to do things safely and trying to do things profitably. None of these decisions are going to be easy. Every decision risks driving up the replication rate, driving up the R factor. And... So all governments and all businesses will be making these calculations all the time and taking risks, and sometimes they'll get lucky. 
other times businesses and governments are going to get burned by the decisions they're made. But let me step back here and let me repeat a point that I made earlier. Except in agribusiness, this whole idea of a business that is focused on biosecurity, that factors biosecurity into its essential operations, this is an unknown thing in business practice, which means there's basically no experience of anyone anywhere who knows how to do it outside of agriculture. There's not really even a strong sense of where to begin. And this now points to the massive risk and opportunity that's opening up immediately in front of us for businesses. Because this is the second big trend that we're seeing over the next 30 weeks. Every business has suddenly become a health business. Now, I didn't come up with that idea myself. That is from Scott Galloway, who's a very bright man. I will post a link to the blog post where he outlines this in detail. This is from last month. Right now, the vast majority of businesses anywhere in the world, and particularly in Australia, but all of these businesses they aren't set up to operate as health businesses. They have no idea about how to create this protective sterile field around their employees, around their customers, around their supply chains, or pretty much anything else. It is as if we're asking a barbershop to go out and suddenly start building a spacecraft. This is not something that is a core competency. And people are gonna give it their best go, but really what we're going to see, and the reason this is a big trend, is we're going to see a lot of businesses have to level up and level up very quickly to become the health businesses that they need to be in order to function in the chronic period of the pandemic. Okay, how does a business do that? Well, large businesses are probably already engaging or engaged in a search for a biosecurity officer. That's someone who's going to be charged with building that sterile field around the employees, around the customers, ensuring the safety of the staff, ensuring the safety of the supply chain. But that hiring, that is just the very first element in what ends up being a very, very transformative process for the business. Because Every business process that involves people interacting in close quarters is now going to have to be revisited and redesigned under the direction of the biosecurity officer. So, I mean, I want you to think about that. Every one of the high-touch processes of a business is now a vector for the transmission of disease. All of those processes are going to need to change. That is going to be the mandate of the biosecurity officer, which means the biosecurity officer is going to be incredibly critical to the organization and incredibly powerful within the organization. And in very short order, that biosecurity officer may be rechristened in a role as chief health officer or in a more millennial organization, chief wellness officer and they'll join the C-suite and they'll be reporting directly to the CEO and the board because there's no question that this emphasis on sterility and health is going to have an impact on the costs of the business, of the profitability of the business. And it's very hard right now to estimate exactly what those costs are going to be. And businesses right now need to be preparing for that. They need to be sort of just taking that deep breath and understanding that the costs for the business are about to change in unexpected ways, perhaps even a little bit unpredictable. And not just because of the pandemic and how that changed business conditions, but because of how we're being forced to respond to the pandemic. And so as these CHOs continue their work of transforming business practices and institutional practices to keep the R rate low, to control the infect, uh, infection, what we're going to see is through their work, we're going to see the next big trend appear. And that's what we call the rise of contactless culture. One of the mandates of the chief health officer in the organization will be that as much as possible, practices have to become contactless. Now, we're already well underway in this in Australia. 
One of the really more interesting things that happened as a result of the pandemic, when everyone in Australia was actually panicking more than a little bit, is that Australians started to Google one particular phrase, how do I clean money? Money, banknotes and coins was seen as being dirty because it was passing through other people's hands and it needed to be avoided. And so very quickly, Australians abandoned cash. We had already been doing it, but it dramatically accelerated. Businesses stopped accepting cash because, again, it's a disease vector. And we all started to go to touchless payments. OK, so that works for money. But how does that work in an office context? How does that work in an elevator? How does that work on public transport? How does it work in a retail environment? When I was doing my research for this talk, I came across this great chart. It talks about which jobs can be best performed remotely. And really what it's asking is, which of these jobs are the most contactless? And of course, you see software and IT, of course, are at the top of the list. And then, well, retail is at the bottom. What that tells us is that things that will be really easy for an Atlassian are going to be a lot more difficult for, say, a meat processor or for a department store. And this is what the chief health officer is going to be telling to a lot of institutions. They're going to be telling them, this is how you need to change your practices, your longstanding, quite profitable practices in order to be safe. Give you an example. I went to the Apple store here in Sydney yesterday at the Broadway Mall uh, because I was picking up a component. And I had an appointment. I got into the queue for people who had appointments. They took my temperature and handed me a mask. And I decided I should take a photo of that because that was how they wanted me. And I'm standing in line waiting for a couple of minutes. And I'm looking at the store. And that's the store in the middle of the afternoon. It's as empty as I've ever seen it because individuals are being led into the store by an employee, being worked with directly by that employee, and then being led out of the store. So Apple stores, which are normally quite beehives of traffic, have been very carefully managed as sterile fields to protect the safety of the employees and to protect the safety of the customers. Now, is all of this truly necessary, or is Apple simply sending a very clear message about the fact that they care and they're doing the hard work and they're accepting the profit hit that they're going to take? So some of this is, I guess you could call it sterility signaling, and that's going to be a thing over the next 30 weeks too. But what it's showing is that Apple has thought this through. They've done the hard work of biosecurity around this. Now, there's going to be pushback here. We already see governments relaxing the rules around the number of people who can be in an elevator because if you have an office tower, you actually need to get people to their offices before the end of the day. Or the number of people who can crowd into public transport, we're seeing some relaxation around that. Every one of these carries a risk of raising the R factor. And we don't know what the middle path is between being relaxed and being sterile. And the real truth of contactless culture is that it's all a great big experiment. We really don't know how much contact we can get away with. And so that means that there's liable to be a lot of very sudden realizations that practices we thought might be safe are not safe, and therefore our practices will have to change, and we will learn our limits of our ability to flout the rules of the pandemic. And that means there will also be similar unpredictabilities in consumer behavior. Something that was previously considered safe can suddenly be seen as dirty. And there are risks either way, because if you have too much sterility, you drown the business in costs and compliance too little, and you open it up to a catastrophic rise of infections. But then we have to ask, well, does any of this really matter? I mean, I was really pleased when I saw the report today. New South Wales has gone seven days without a case of a community transmitted infection. They've gone a month in the ACT, three weeks in South Australia, I think 20 days in Tasmania. And in New Zealand, again, they're doing super, super well on this. So... Maybe the sterile bubble is bigger than we think it is. Maybe it covers the whole nation 
Maybe it covers the whole nation and New Zealand. And if that's the case, we might be able to get away with a lot. And businesses and institutions, they might be able to actually not be quite as vigilant as we're being told to be. We're being told not to be complacent. We're being told not to let our guard down. And that advice is absolutely correct. Yet we seem to have gone a long way to accidentally eliminating the infection inside our bubble. And that brings us to the last of the four big trends that will dominate this year. That bubble, what it will do for us and what it will do to us. Because right now, we can safely operate within this bubble. You know, we're an island, we have strict quarantines, we have massive testing, we're doing all of the right things. We have an army of contact tracers, so if there are any infections, we can trace it all out and keep that infection under control. And while we still need to be careful, it may be that the costs incurred in keeping the R rate low aren't gonna be as great as we think. Maybe they're gonna be relatively modest. They're gonna be a factor. They might not be an overwhelming factor. But there's a paradox here because the safer it becomes inside our bubble, the more dangerous the outside world begins to look. And Australia is a trading nation, right? We are dependent on revenue from international tourism, from international students. The bubble may be very comfortable but there's not really a whole lot of air in here. There's not enough air in here for us to breathe forever. And so the better that we have it in here, and we have it pretty good in here right now, you have to admit that, the more dangerous it starts to look beyond our bubble on the other side, and the more reluctant we're going to be to take the risks that we will need to take to resume our deep connections with the rest of the world. And that's going to be front of mind for many businesses. It's going to be front of mind for institutions all over the next 30 weeks. I mean, just take a look at the arguments that are going on about lowering the bubbles between the states right now. You can see how that's playing out. So we're going to have to have a think about how to build a new kind of economy that is mostly in the bubble. All of the time, though, we will be running out of air, and we will be very, very aware of the fact that we're running out of air, because we will be running out of money, and we will be looking to that fresh air that is just on the other side of that bubble. Fresh air and infection. And this is a dilemma. You can't solve a dilemma. All you can do with a dilemma is endure it. And so this period of 30 weeks, it's, in some respects, it's going to resemble an endurance test. And the businesses that make it through this period, they will be preparing today for the kind of endurance that they need to see them through. And it's a future that we can't really see because we can't see beyond the end of the year yet. Our planning horizon doesn't extend that far. Right now, we need to act as though that bubble will persist until further notice. And we need to make our decisions accordingly. All right, I want to conclude with a few suggestions about how you as leaders can lead your organizations through the most chaotic period any of us have known in our lifetimes. Because the pandemic has proved a massive accelerator of some trends that were already well underway, but hadn't actually been embraced that broadly by businesses. And one of those is the transformation of work. Now, that is not just work from home, although that is happening. We're in the midst of a really fundamental shift in the nature of work. Now, in the industrial era, people were more or less 
replaceable cogs within a gigantic machine. And it didn't matter whether that person was working in a production line or in a hospital. Everyone had their set of tasks defined to a role. People were hired into that role. They might move on to a new role. They might get a promotion. But the role itself was part of the organizational structure. And if they moved on, someone else would come in and fill that role. So it was really something about the organization rather than something about the person. And the shift that we'd already started to see before the pandemic was this steady migration away from the idea of a person filling a role to the idea of a person as a possessor of a set of capacities that they make available to the organization. It's a movement from a static definition of what a person does to a dynamic from the steady state to an evolving. And that was always really a bit of an ask for an organization that had grown up around this idea of static roles. When you're moving into capacity-based practices, what you're doing is you're really redesigning business practices around meeting needs that can be flexibly configured from the capacities that are available through the people in the organization. Now, that slow and very gradual migration of business practices, well, the pandemic has just jumped that to the front of the queue because there's no longer any business as usual. And all of these thoughts about roles, well, when you survey the environment, you aren't now looking to see how those roles are working. What you're doing is you're looking to see how the capacities of the people you have working with you are fit to the needs of a very flexible, mutable, changeable set of circumstances, which is the chronic phase of the pandemic. And come back to the point that I made a little bit earlier, this idea that biosecurity capacities in the organization, which didn't exist before last month, that they now organize themselves around a chief health officer. And almost all businesses are lacking those capacities right now. But that's just the beginning, because as soon as you bring the biosecurity officer into the organization, they transform the organization in unexpected ways. Most of those ways require new capacities. And so what you get is a bit of a domino effect. And the first domino has already fallen over. So that transition between just role-based business operations and now capacity-based businesses, I call this trajectory-based planning. That is, you take a look at where you want to go with the business, and then you do an inventory of the capacities that you're going to need, the physical resources and the human resources that you're going to need to get yourself there. Take that inventory, run that inventory against what you know you have. And then actually measure that inventory against the inventory of the capacities that already exist in the personnel in your organization. Now, this, this point is hard because most organizations, they aren't actually very well aware of all of the capacities of all of the people working with them. Because businesses that are bound to the practice of roles don't see individuals as sets of capacities. They see them as fulfilling functions inside of a business organizational chart. They don't think in terms of capacities of people. They have very little awareness of what their people are capable of. So let's step back a half step and consider what it might be like to take a full inventory of all of the capacities of all of the people in your organization. What would that reveal? Now, I could go on about this at length and in other talks I have, but I feel right now it's just enough for me to raise that with you because it should be enough to get you to ponder the potential. Make that inventory of the capacities of your people. You will be surprised by what they can do for you. Now, when you have that inventory in hand, look at the inventory that you created to get you to where you need to go over the next, say, 30 weeks through to the end of the year. Do you have everything you need in the inventory of capacities? 
You probably don't. But now you know, and you know what you need, and so now you can work to get those capacities. You can build them in your existing staff by upskilling them. You can go outside the organization and hire them in. Now, just as an aside, everyone in the organization is also keeping an inventory of their own capacities, and they're taking a look at where the organization is going and where they see the organizational needs for capacities diverging from their own capacities. Those people are on their way out of the organization. Where they see them converging, that's where you could see personnel reinforcing the resilience of the organization. You know what capacities you need. You build them. You use them to set out on your trajectory. And then, and I'm very sorry about this, the goalposts are going to move. I mean, that happens in the best of times. But right now, that's happening all the time. You're going to be headed on a trajectory with a plan, and the ground underneath you is going to shift suddenly because that's just the nature of the world we're living in right now. And the plan is going to make less sense at the end of a quarter than maybe it did at the start. Now, you can't fix the world. You can't make the world any more predictable because the period we're in is not highly predictable. But what you can do is you can go back to your planning. You can adjust your trajectory to the new circumstances. You can then inventory the new capacities you're going to need on that new trajectory, check that against the skills and capacities inside your organization, and then grow the additional capacities or bring them in. And that process of checking and adjusting the trajectory of the business, that's something that businesses already do. But the tempo for that is about to increase markedly. And those adjustments are going to increase. Maybe it's something the business does once a year. My advice is right now you should probably be revisiting your trajectory once a month. Now, the opportunity here is that as you grow more flexible with your adjustments in your trajectory, when you have a flexible organization that's drawing its strength from its capacities rather than its roles, it's going to be able to thrive even in very difficult conditions. Now, I'm hoping what can happen is that we can all learn from the chaos and be better because of it. But that said, I think it is really important as I close to remind everyone if it isn't clear from everything I've just covered in the last 40 minutes, how different the world is right now. I mean, everything has changed. And we are all dealing with all sorts of stresses that we've never dealt with before. And we need to keep that front of mind. Leaders in particular need to keep that front of mind. Now, America is having a very rough period right now, but I pulled these two photos. The top photo is the mayor of Los Angeles. A crowd marched to his residence last night, angry crowd. He got out in front and knelt with them. Down below, you see the St. Paul police force taking the knee. Right now, what we need, and particularly what leaders need, are humility and empathy. Humility and empathy are not weaknesses. In times of great change, humility and empathy are the source of our resilience. They're our strength. Good luck and thank you.